wanted to take a brief moment to discuss uh, the background on PTEC and some of you are new to joining us. Um, this is our second event and uh, many of you are aware that there's um, a lot of existing health inequities experienced by the Black, Latinx and Native American communities due to um, which is just ever increasing due to this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's important to understand why these gaps exist and how health policies have fallen short for racial minorities and socioeconomically disadvantaged communities. Um, PTEC was founded this past fall and is focused on metrics and reimbursement. We are bringing together various sectors of healthcare, such as healthcare providers, researchers, life sciences companies, and advocates to study and address the inequities in pandemic preparedness and treatment. On that note, we are thrilled to have Dr. Danielle Gadsden with us today. Dr. Gadsden is an assistant professor at Villanova's Public Administration Department. As a medical sociologist and public administrator, Dr. Gadsden explores how social factors such as race, socioeconomic status, and neighborhood characteristics influence the e efficacy of public policy initiatives. Dr. Gadsden is a member of the National Society for Public Affairs and Administration and is the chair of Villanova's Public Administration Department's Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Committee. Dr. Gadsden, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and thanks for having me. So I uh, just wanted to, to spend a couple of minutes as we get our uh, uh, panel discussion and our, our time today, today together um, to talk a bit more about uh, health equity as, um, as Jennifer uh, explained. Um, so again, I'm a, a medical sociologist as well as a public administrator. And so I'm going to challenge us today to um, kind of put on our our sociological hats and, and use our sociological imaginations to think about this issue of um, health inequities and what it is that we can do about it from, from a policy perspective and kind of where some of those, those shortcomings are. The main point that I want to make uh, this, this afternoon um, is that health equity is tough, right? It's a hard problem to solve. Um, and we have to make, go beyond performative statements, right, in our organizations um, as, as it relates to our, our different um, approaches, especially as we, um, again, think of, of COVID-19 um, as well, that it, it goes beyond the words, it goes beyond the intent to actually making real change, right, in, in our societies, right? So in medical sociology, right, we think about what does it mean to be sick, right? What does it mean socially to be sick? All of you uh, who have uh, medical backgrounds, biomedical, pharmaceutical um, uh, backgrounds, you understand what it means medically to be sick, right? The clinical um, um, presentation of illness. But I also want us to think about what does it mean socially to be sick, right? to give someone a diagnosis, right? That right now I, I'm a certain person in society, right? I have a certain role, I interact a certain way with society and you as a, as a, a, a physician could give me a diagnosis. And now all of a sudden I'm a different person. There are different expectations, right? Biologically I'm the same, right? Because I still had that, whatever that disease condition was, I still had it one minute ago right? But now I interact differently with society, right? And so medical sociologists think about how we ought, right, to, to act as the sick individual, right, as the person that is impacted, how we ought to act in society once we know we're sick, right? And we see a lot of this policing as we think about, again, COVID-19 and mask wearing and social distancing, etc., right? And also think about how society treats people, right? that are experiencing illness. Medical providers, right, have more of a, of a colorblind, socioeconomic blind approach to medicine, right? We, uh, as, as medical uh, providers, treat people equally, treat people fairly, right, ideally, right, treat our, treat our patients the same. But as a society, we don't treat people the same, um, 
based on illness because we're interested in who that person is, right? What is your role? How do you, how do you contribute, right? And these are these are hard truths, right? How are you contributing to our society? And are you doing the things um, that we we need you to do? And is your illness stopping you from doing what we need you to do, right? And also thinking about um, how that person got sick, right? Which which oftentimes makes a difference as well in our society, right? So depending on who we are, how we got sick, right? Our 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 roles in in society's reaction to us can change. So I say all of that to say, you know, perhaps our, our challenge ahead of us would be a bit easier, still quite complex, difficult, um, if it were only just a clinical piece that we need to deal with as we address the issue of health equity. But when we bring in the social, right, it becomes even more difficult. And that's something that we have to recognize and we can't just kind of sweep under the rug or behind well-meaning and beautiful programs, right, that really don't get to the root of the issues that, that, we, that we face, right? So when we say we have equity policy, health equity policies or policies that promote health equity, many times it can be a performative statement, right? I wanna push us, I wanna push us beyond that, that sense of, of um, speaking, you know, talking the talk, right? But not necessarily walking the walk. Um, I have a couple of slides uh, that I'd like to, to share with you um, as well with, in, my, um, in my brief time. Um, in this uh, first slide here, which, which talks about social factors as a, as a fundamental cause of disease, is, is really um, my inspiration uh, for the work uh, that I do um, as a public administrator and a medical sociologist. Um, Bruce Link um, is an um, uh, epidemiologist um, who also um, is a sociologist, um, and his colleague Joe Fellin, um, who is a sociologist, have been credited with this um, framework that talks about social factors as the fundamental cause of disease, right? So this is, again, a different way of thinking than what we may be uh, accustomed to, right, from a clinical perspective, right? So fundamental, fundamentally, this is why we have difference in disease, right, according to this particular framework. So let's look at their words for a moment, right? They say that when a population develops the wherewithal to avoid disease and death, right? Once we figure it out, once we have the vaccine, once we know the treatment plans, once we can do the testing, right? Once we can isolate clinically, biologically the problem, right? Individuals' ability to benefit from that wherewithal is shaped by resources of knowledge, money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections, right? We don't want this to be the way that, that our world works, right? We, we wouldn't you know, dare suggest that uh, we're going to purposefully prioritize people based on their money, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections. But what we do as a society, right, while we, while we don't talk this talk, right, we do walk this walk, right? We do walk this walk. Think about, right, over the weekend, as you've seen both formally and informally through, you know, uh, uh, studies and, and um, news and media, but also informally through social networks, think about the vaccines, right? And who's becoming vaccinated, right? In these, in these last few, few weeks, right? Once we've moved beyond uh, the, the, the healthcare workers and, and frontline essential workers, now we're in this pool, right? Where you need to know, right? Even if you're eligible, first, first you need to know the eligibility, right? For sure, right? And once you're eligible, you need to know what to do or where to go in order to get your vaccine. That has proven very difficult for some members of our population. My parents last week, uh, they live in Florida. They're both African-American, um, fairly well off. Um, they both received their uh, vaccine. Um, and most of that is due to the fact that my mother finds it to be sport, to acquire things that are difficult to acquire. 
she will stay on the phone for hours. She will go into send 50 emails if she has to. She makes it sport in order to acquire the things that are difficult to acquire. And because of that perseverance and because she's got the time, right? She's retired, she's sitting on her lanai in Florida. And so she can go through all of these steps to make sure that she and my father are on, are on the list, right? But that is very much shaped by the free time that she has and the lifestyle, right, that, that she lives. So we want to be aware of this, and, and again, not to, and also to not to mention, right, individuals in our society that have literally offered money, right, to be put on lists, to be moved up on lists, et cetera, right? When money is not an, an issue, right, the expectation in our society is that you should be able to pay for it, right? It may not be moral, right, but it's not a wild expectation, right? Not a wild expectation. I also wanted to briefly share with you, and, I, and I'm sure many of you know these by heart, right, in terms of the CDC uh, distribution guidelines in your particular localities and states where you are, um, are likely to be, a, a, you know, you have some sort of variation of this. Uh, but I went to the CDC's website and pulled off their guidelines from um, uh, the last update was January 8th. Um, and the piece that I'm most interested in are, are these, these three uh, bullet points at the top. Right, uh, where they kind of, you know, in the in the introductory statements around, um, you know, prioritization and who's going to get the vaccine first. Right, um, the CDC states that the prioritization recommendations were made with particular goals in mind. First, decrease de de death and in serious disease as much as possible. Decrease death and serious disease as much as possible. Second, preserve the functioning of society. And third, reduce the extra burden of COVID-19 um, that it's having on people already facing disparities. What jumps out to me, right, is this phrase, this first bullet point in the phrase as much as possible, right? Again, for those of us that are committed to, to health equity um, and interested in, in this topic and, and see the importance of this topic, I find it curious. I find it curious that the as much as possible is on the first bullet point, but not the second, right? So we want to do as a society what we can to decrease death and serious disease, right? But we also have to, to, to hamper is the word that's coming to, to mind, but we also have to mitigate that, right? We can't do it all, right? We can't solve the entire problem because there's other stuff we need to do. We need to first preserve the functioning of society, right? And it doesn't say preserve the, preserve the function of society as much as possible, right? It says preserve the functioning of society. That's an imperative. That's something that we need to do, right? That should be our first priority, right? But remember, built into this, we have already, we know, right, that in our society, we have systemic built-in inequalities. And to pre preserve the function of society is to reinforce, right? To reinforce those same inequalities, right? It may not be purposeful, but that's happening along the way, right? We're reinforcing the ways in which we distribute vaccines and, and, and medicine to people. We're using the same connections, right? That we have to communities, to hospitals, to physicians, right? We're, we're reinforcing what it is that we have, right, in terms of preserving this initial function of society, which, you know, is wonderful, but also has its problems, right, also has its issue, issues, right. And then this third bullet about reducing the extra burden on COVID-19 on, on um, people already facing disparities, right, I don't really see that in, in, in 1A, B, and C. Now, some of those people are in there, right? So again, we're kind of getting that along the way, right? And then this, this last statement here, it actually um, kind of brought me to tears, right? As vaccine availability increases, vaccination recommendations will include more groups. We'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there. But we have to do these things first, right? When I think about what's happening in, in our most vulnerable, communities. That's, that's heartbreaking. 
So I'm going to take just about uh, two more minutes here to, to make two, uh, final, um, two final points related to this. Um, I was curious, um, and um, in addition to my parents, I have many um, friends and, and colleagues from um, undergrad and, and graduate school that, that are um, in the medical field, um, and so saw lots of people getting, you know, um, vaccination shots uh, on my social media and also um, on the news. And I went into uh, Google and just Googled a couple of pictures of, of, of healthcare providers getting uh, vaccines on air. And I picked the first five or six pictures that I came up with. Back in September, uh, the CDC had done a study about the characteristics of health, pers health personnel um, with COVID-19 right, uh, and actually did a study, right, to understand are there additional disparities um, in, in, um, in, that, in that case, right, and so this comes directly from the report. They said that, you know, nursing and residential care facilities were the most commonly reported job settings, um, and nursing, the most single, uh, common single occupation type of um, healthcare providers um, with COVID-19 in six jurisdictions. So they found that nurses, right, in residential care facilities were, were really mostly um, uh, uh, in danger of death uh, should they, should they um, get COVID-19. A lot of what we saw in the news was, were hospital systems, right, where, where people um, were being um, vaccinated, but, but that's okay, right, when we think about the imagery of, of what was being done. But there's a first part to this, to this, um, to this paragraph. The first part to the paragraph says that healthcare professionals with COVID-19 who died tended to be older, male, Asian, Black, and have an underlying medical condition when compared with health healthcare providers who did not die. And I had to think, right, have I seen this, this imagery, right? I would have no idea about this, right? If, if we think about the messages that we send, right, about who is being vaccinated, who, who's, it, who's most important, right? Who we should prioritize in terms of being vaccinated as well, right? Why not have an older Asian male um, that maybe has an a, a, a underlying condition like obesity, right? Receiving the first vaccine, because that's not the story that we wanna tell, right? So we have to balance we have to balance the story that we want to tell as a society, right? Preserve the functioning of society against the realities of what it is that, that, we're, that we're going through. So finally, um, I just wanted to, to, to add some glimmers of hope uh, that you can certainly Google if you're not uh, familiar with um, already or look up um, some studies. Uh, West Virginia uh, has um, been consistently doing an, an extraordinary job as it relates to um, COVID-19 and, uh, and the response. Um, they have made decisions around, um, you know, prioritizing the most vulnerable populations in their, in their localities. Um, it's nursing homes, right? Um, putting nursing homes first, saying everyone, all nursing homes are going to be prioritized, using existing um, systems that nursing homes have with smaller pharmacies um, in order to identify patients in the nursing homes, being able to complete the paperwork ahead of time so that when the vaccines came, they were ready. And within a week, 90% were um, shot in arm, right? Similarly, for Native American communities, they, we recognized as, as, a, as a, um, the federal government recognized that there's a difference in culture there that we need to pay attention to. And so really gave a lot of the autonomy to um, coordination of the Indian Health, uh, coordination by the Indian Health Service, who worked with individual tribes to do what was best for them, right? To do what is best for them. So this is recognizing, right? And trying to move towards equality, recognizing that you can't have one blanket process, right? You have to think about what works for that particular community, being willing to take an alternative path. We don't always have to take these stringent paths that everyone else is taking. Do what's best for your communities, right? And the last piece that I'll add to this is that, again, health equity is hard, right? It's challenging. It's pushing against the grain, 
right? It's, it's uncomfortable, it's expensive, it takes time. So if we're feeling warm and fuzzy, right? After our, our, our program implementation of a, of a special program, right? Oftentimes that's, that's, that's charity. We need charity as well, right? Charity helps people, but it doesn't change the underlying factors. And that's what we need to be doing. All right. Oh, all right. My timer's going right off. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kirsten. Thank you so much, Dr. Getson. Um, I think a real call to action for those involved in administration or in the informing of guidelines. We know uh, what the people look like and where they live who are suffering and dying and um, a call to more explicitly call out risk factors that are socioeconomic that go beyond um, some of the ones that I think we commonly turn to. Um, really grateful for you for joining us. So I'm gonna turn next to our panel um, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Ebony David, uh, a executive director in HR for Quest Diagnostics, one of our sponsors. But more than that, um, she's also the founder of the Quest for Equity, Equity Initiative, which I'm gonna let her speak to about more eloquently than I can. Um, and then Drs. Uh, Stray Ram uh, Kui and Elizabeth Cody. Um, whose experience in their current roles are only a tiny tip of, of their experience and, and diversity of the work they have done. Um, uh, Elizabeth in uh, the area currently of, of informing employer benefit design and Stray Ram in uh, both Medicaid and in and the VA. Um, so what I'd like to ask you all to do is to introduce yourselves with, um, by also answering, telling us who you are and by also answering the question, Health equity and health disparities are two terms that are often used interchangeably, but they mean different things. I think often leading to, to, uh, to errors in communication. Can you uh, please tell us about yourself and what you do through your work uh, to achieve greater health equity? Um, so maybe we'll start with, uh, with Ebony, then Stray Ram, then Elizabeth. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. So I'm Ebony David, I'm an uh, HR business partner. That's what I've been my entire career. I partner with really smart business leaders and help them look even smarter. That's what I tell them all the time. Um, and in my most recent role for the last 18 months, I'm also leading inclusion and diversity for all 48,000 of my colleagues at Quest Diagnostics. So health equity and health disparity, quite honestly, I never thought would be part of my vernacular of what I did every day. And in this last year with the pandemic, with Quest being on the forefront with testing, we are you know, testing, I think as of this week, over 30 million people have ran their tests through us um, and quite a few positives as you all know. As we got through this pandemic, when we realized that we were in a COVID-19 pandemic and then we entered a social and racial um, injustice pandemic that's actually been going on for hundreds of years, it was just getting the recognition it was due as we were in the middle of a different pandemic. We as an organization said, I remember my CEO said, Ebony, I've been having this inclusion and diversity and this healthcare disparity discussion my entire career. And I won't tell you how long his career has been, but he's the CEO of our company. So it's pretty lengthy. And he said to me, whatever we do, I wanna make it so that the person who sits in this seat after me is looking at a different problem, not the one we've been trying to solve my entire career. And so what we launched with one of our, actually our vice president of infectious disease, Ruth Clements spearheaded it. Um, and we now call it Quest for Health Equity. And it's a commitment to close the healthcare disparity gap within our country. And it's a hundred million dollar commitment. The beauty of it is it's not focused on diagnostics. So to your question is, you can't close the health equity gap if you don't deal with the social determinants of health. If you don't deal with the housing crisis, if you don't deal with the food inequity um, or the food deserts that many people uh, have in their communities, then you'll never close that. And so this particular initiative is focused on testing primary right now, because that's what we need in our communities. And we are partnering and testing as much as we can and getting it you know, what, um, what we just heard about is, you know, we can't get the vaccine to folks. Well, yeah, but we can't even test folks to let them know that they are sick and that they are asymptomatic and that, you know, they are frontline workers, but they're living at home with parents and grandparents 
who need to be protected. And so we need to get them that information. And so we're going into those markets and actually getting our testing. But more importantly, we're also going into kindergarten and first grade and we're teaching nutrition and we're educating and we're going into federally qualified health centers and we're educating and funding initiatives that they all wanna do and they just couldn't afford because they're already treating. And so we're just trying to add and do our part, which we think all companies in all industries have a part in. Thank you so much. Sri Ram, do you wanna give your reply? Wow, that, that's a hard one to follow. <laughs> Ebony, that's amazing the work you're doing. And, and thank you, Kirsten, for, for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. This is such an important topic. And I think all of us in healthcare leadership absolutely need to prioritize this. Um, I think in, in terms of my experiences, uh, so I previously served as chief medical officer for Medicaid for the state of Louisiana and, um, and also as a deputy undersecretary for uh, health for community care for the Department of Veterans Affairs and as a advisor, special advisor to the secretary of the VA. And, and so I've, I've served in a variety of different roles, but all of them in government, whether it's at the state level or the federal level, and, and for large populations that are very vulnerable, both the Medicaid population and the veteran population that, that experience many of these uh, things that we talk about in terms of equity and, and disparities in healthcare. And I think that one of the great things that I've learned um, from, from these experiences working in healthcare leadership in uh, state and federal healthcare programs is there is so much opportunity to make a real lasting impact and to do it on a large level um, uh, in, in state and federal governments. And I really stress the word opportunity because it doesn't always happen but there is that opportunity. And um, so I'll, I'll give an example. For example, when I started as chief milk officer for Louisiana Medicaid in May, 2016, we were just beginning our work around um, expanding Medicaid. Previously in Louisiana, Medicaid access, so access to healthcare through Medicaid was only open to uh, low-income pregnant women, children, and disabled patients. With Medicaid expansion, we we're able to expand it to low-income young adults. And that, I think, was, was a phenomenal thing we were able to do. Um, at that time in Louisiana, prior to Medicaid expansion, Louisiana ranked 50th in the country for many of the health outcomes we were measuring, including cancer. Um, and and when, you, when you look uh, at, for instance, um, among uh, uh, Black residents in Louisiana, 28% of Black residents, that's more than one in four Black residents, reported being in fair or poor health compared with 19% um, uh, of their white counterparts. And we looked at Hispanic uh, uh, Louisiana residents at that time, 37% um, reported not having any personal doctor compared with 22% of their white counterparts. So um, amongst all this health disparity, also at the same time, Louisiana at the time had one of the highest rates of uh, opioid overdoses in the countries and opioid prescriptions. We had more opioid prescriptions per capita than people in the state. And that's counting children and babies in that population when we're, we're doing the capita count. So um, what do you do when you're confronted with <laughs> this overwhelming amount of health inequity and disparity? It, it's easy just to throw up your hands and say, that's the way it is. Um, it, this is something that's deeply ingrained and it's uh, rooted in many economic and social factors. Um, but you can't throw up your hands and say that that's the way it is um, because the buck stops with you. And, and in healthcare leadership, in whatever role it is, that is your responsibility. That's your reason for being there. So um, with Medicaid expansion, by expanding access to healthcare to low-income young adults, we, um, we needed to also demonstrate that not only did we give people access to healthcare, the opportunity to healthcare, but that we actually made an impact in lives and that outcomes were improved. Um, that was important on many levels because a, a lot of money is being spent and you have to demonstrate that the money you spent makes a real difference. It's important to be able to take that back to the governor, to take that to the legislators. And I'm, I'm so proud of my team at Medicaid. They, they are so phenomenal and so proud of them. We developed on um, these novel metrics to measure how does expanding access to healthcare impact people's lives? And so the metrics we created, we were able to measure how many uh, patients after Medicaid expansion were able to say, get a breast cancer screening. 
Um, and among those, how many were diagnosed with breast cancer and were able to get treated? How many patients uh, were able to uh, get diagnosed with diabetes and as a result of now knowing their diagnosis, able to get treatment? Or um, And how many um, were able to get diagnosed with hypertension? And we took that data and we put it out public in a public dashboard so that anyone could look at it, whether you're the governor of the state or the legislators or uh, any community member, any member of the lay public. And that I think is one of the key things is making the data available to everyone. That is how you, um, with that freedom of information are able to help tackle uh, healthcare and equity. And what we were able to demonstrate, um, and we have th th that dashboard still lives on long after I've left uh, Medicaid and I'm, I'm very proud of it because what we've been able to demonstrate is that um, since uh, uh, it's the summer of 2016, when we expanded, we have now uh, demonstrated that 96,000 women, low-income women in Louisiana, were able to get breast cancer screening. And among those, 1,000 of them were diagnosed with breast cancer. Without that diagnosis, they wouldn't be able to get that treatment. Um, among that, uh, uh, 24,000 adults were diagnosed with diabetes and are now being treated. Uh, 65,000 of these adults, and this is all on that public dashboard, uh, were diagnosed with hypertension are now being treated. And when you think of the downstream effects of untreated diabetes, untreated hypertension, the immense amount of morbidity and mortality, the, the immense economic costs and the immense uh, toll on people's personal lives of having diabetes and hypertension untreated, that is a, that is a huge uh, change. Uh, one of my personal favorites is we were able to uh, use our metric to assess how many patients got um, colonoscopies. And we were able to, to demonstrate that 57,000 adults were able to get a uh, colonoscopy. And among that, 17,000 had a colon polyp removed. And as a surgeon, that's 17,000 adults that are not going to show up in my operating room down the road with a colon cancer they have to operate on. Uh, so I, 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 I say this to demonstrate what a huge opportunity you have in state and federal government to make a real impact on people's lives and to do it on a wide scale and to do it rapidly. And I say this because many people say that government moves at a snail's pace. And um, I, I say that uh, you have the opportunity to make a real impact and to do it fast and to really make a change in, in equity and in disparities. Thank you so much. What a bold move to put up the data measuring yourselves um, to as a, as a public record. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Cody, can I turn it to you, please? Yeah, Sir, so, um, thank you so much for that perfect lead in talking about the importance of public initiatives to address health inequities and um, I'll get to addressing what we can do in, in the private sphere to in our, in our administration address inequities. Um, but I'm a frontline provider. I'm a primary care provider. I've spent time actually side by side with the Secretary of Health and Human Services deciding what's going to be included in the Affordable Care Act in the White House. I've also spent years in the Indian Health Services and currently I serve homeless and um, incarcerated individuals struggling with drug abuse. That's my side job. My main job is that I try to make health benefit design um, benefit the consumer more. <laughs> And within that, we have found it. Um, there's a lot of inequities. This is no surprise. I love Dr. Gadsden's question, who gets to avoid disease and death? And I'll say it was a long struggle just to get to health care equality. That was a part of the civil rights struggle that the NAACP fought for, that Title VI made um, come to some sort of realization that we still had segregated healthcare systems, but at least now all people supposedly, regardless of their racial ethnic background, should have access to these public um, provisions of healthcare resources. That's only a little part of the picture. 60% um, of Americans have access to insurance through the private marketplace. And now that we've come from the civil rights bill, which really was a huge healthcare rights bill, we're still dealing with an inequitable healthcare system that was really um, evolved in the same history that the nation evolved into. That's one where power was distributed to 
and health insurance was distributed at the time of World War II and the Industrial Revolution to white male workers so that they could retain them. That's an aberration. No other country does it like that and persisted like that. If you were poor or indigent, you got charitable um, health care coverage. And that could be like our uh, parallel to our public system. And if you were black, you often were not considered even part of the pool to be eligible for that charitable system. So thankfully, um, with the civil rights, the um, I, I would say like the legacy of civil rights. Now we have a little bit more um, of an equitable footing, but that's just equal. That's just equality. That's not equity. So to get to to Kirsten's question about what is what is e equity versus equality, it's not saying oh everyone can go to a federal you know everyone can access a federal program. It's saying everyone gets the the same opportunity to have their best healthcare outcomes. Now that is really a different answer for someone who's grown up in decades of trauma, like a Indian in the Indian um, healthcare services, or comes from you know decades of slavery and poverty. So what will get us to the opportunity to have an equal healthcare outcome? And that's what disparity is, right? Disparity is: are there differences in healthcare outcomes that are related to race, ethnicity, these social determinants of health? So we have a landscape and I really think we must look at insurance as part of that because someone's insurance status is a fundamental predictor of the quality of the care they receive. Generally speaking in studies, private insurance being a higher quality than public and public being a higher quality than not insurance at all. How are we gonna move forward in that, that, that long history? We didn't, this is a long history we're trying to combat and build from. And what I like about the work we can do in the private sector is we can hold big employers accountable and say, you know what? Giving health insurance benefits out is giving power out. It's giving wealth out. And the way you give that out across income brackets, the way you give that out to people of different, uh, who identify differently in terms of their race or their gender, that holds you accountable to not just being a, saying something performative, but actually doing something actionable and accountable. So that's what we're working on now is, um, and it's amazing how much disparity within one employer can exist for a low, the low, their low income workers who don't benefit from the tax advantages of what their high income workers can benefit from. So this is a lever I'm interested in right now is holding those people who are appointing chiefs of diversity, equity, inclusion to say, Where's the money going in your benefit structure? How is, are you addressing the chronic issues of mostly lower income workers so that they can have the same outcomes as higher income workers? Are you allowing them the same access to tax advantaged healthcare um, structures so that they can have wealth equity too? Are you deconstructing the institutionalized health and wealth inequities that your benefit structures, the traditional ones that we all think are equal, everyone gets a, the same contribution, are really inequitable. So those are my definitions. That's how I would define it in terms of my experience. Thank you so much. And, and as I mentioned, Elizabeth is one of the people I, I think of knowing that her current, her current job does not describe the incredible diversity of work she does. I'm sure mostly unpaid um, and paid um, to, uh, to, to uh, improve health, um, particularly for people who are vulnerable. So now I'm gonna ask a quick question to each one of our panelists before I'm gonna turn it over to Serena at uh, 1250 for audience questions. So we thinking of those in the next 10 minutes, please. Um, so for each of you, I'm, I'll start off with uh, Ms. Ebony David. Um, you know, while it may seem obvious to many of us that the lack of social justice and the inequity in our healthcare system is not just bad for healthcare, it's bad for business, not all leaders uh, are going to be as receptive as, as your CEO is, it sounds like. Can you describe to us, um, you know, what are the tools that you've used to convince business leaders that paying attention to social justice, to health inequity, is important um, and fundamental to being uh, a thriving uh, private business in healthcare. Thank you for the question. And it is really important. What I'll tell you is I do think the journey our country is on, um, you know, there's lots of feedback on the media uh, and regardless of where you stand, I think we all agree, there's definitely been more public focus 
on disparity. Um, and that has been helpful. But what I tell you I did is I really met leaders where they were at. This was not an initiative I was gonna gain buy-in and support in a meeting of the masses. I met people individually. I let them know what our priorities were, why those were our priorities. I deal with a lot of doctors and sciences and you know, they love data. So I brought a lot of data, um, but I also brought my heart. And this is a, a story of using your head and your heart. And sometimes one is in front of the other, but to the bottom line of a for-profit business, because make no mistake, that's what we are. This heart work makes all the sense in the world because financially we will do better because it improves our inclusion and diversity programs. It, inc it um, increases the buy-in. I can tell you our engagement scores for our employees. We do a annual and actually now we do pulse surveys. So we're doing them every quarter. Our first pulse survey, we had over 2000 comments just on quest for health equity and how proud people were that we were helping communities. They actually were able to ask, can you help this community? Can you help this particular initiative? And so we really met leaders where they are, which brought our all 48,000 of us along the journey. And the other advice I give is it is not a one and done, right? You, it is not 30 minutes and this is the right thing. And are you going to sign off and anticipate and expect everyone's there? We do have some international colleagues that very transparently don't have the same appreciation of the journey our country has gone on. And so there's lots of education there. Um, and I, I really took the time. And I will say it was a little frustrating. And there are a lot of folks in, in a sit in a seat like mine, whether you're you know, in my role, which is dual, or you're a chief diversity officer or DEI, which is the new term that you're hearing, you know, you'll hear about a lot of churn that leaders are moving companies and, and, and doing that because sometimes there is frustration because in our heart and in our head, we know what we need to do. And it's not always easy convincing those leaders. And so you think, you know what, I'm going to go convince these other leaders because <laughs> they're going to listen. And what I'd encourage them to do is be patient. I know you've been on this journey many, many years as we all have for, you know, for people of color, many of us feel like this has been a personal journey most of our lives. And when you have the honor of holding a title like we do, you also feel the obligation to deliver not only for your colleagues, but for people of color across the globe. I, at least that's what I feel. I feel like I need to make a difference for as many people as I can. And I have to give myself the grace and the patience to allow people to go on that journey with me. I've been on it 40 plus years. I won't get any more specific than that. And I have to appreciate not everyone has. And so meet your leaders individually, get your supporters, educate them and arm them. So when you get in with the masses, you have all the support in all shades and colors and tenures and levels that just resonates. And it's like a heartbeat and it just gets louder and louder and louder until your organization is on board. Um, you can do it. And if you need help, you just call a colleague like me. And I feel like anyone in this space is my colleague. I'm not, I don't care what your Zoom background says. <laughs> I feel like you are my colleague and it is my obligation and to help as I'd appreciate your help. And that's how we get work done. We support each other in this field to help our world, to help those who need it um, and to help those who need it most and don't know how to ask or don't want to ask because of the experience they've had in this country. Thank you so much. Well, you, your phone may start ringing. <laughs> so, Dr. Sveirankui, you know, you mentioned that I, I believe is true that very often uh, federal programs like the VA or state programs like Medicaid can push out health interventions, specifically those that address health, address health disparities um, systematically, uniformly, and collect data, as you mentioned. So how do we, how do private sector uh, health systems, how do companies that are developing drugs, diagnostics, medical interventions, learn from what you do in, in uh, the VA or in Medicaid to help address health disparities, whether it's to design better products or, or be helpful in assisting on those programs? Well, uh, I loved, Kirsten, what Ebony said earlier about meeting with people and that one-on-one, -on -one because that is how you change cultures. Um, uh, I, when, when I served as Chief Medical Officer for Louisiana Medicaid, when I served as Deputy Undersecretary at the VA, in any of these roles, I was meeting with people all the time. and. 
And I, I, I think public and uh, private partnerships are so powerful. Um, uh, I, I, I think reach out and uh, people absolutely want to partner and collaborate because many people have the same goal. What we want is we want to make healthcare better for people and we want to make it better for everyone. Um, I don't think anyone would ever say no if you knock on their door and, and, and come. And uh, one of the, the things that we did at the VA when I was serving as a special advisor to the secretary is we worked on a public and private partnership to um, uh, uh, on a $50 million grant to um, uh, uh, improve precision medicine um, so genomic uh, medicine uh, for, for veterans. And it was a lot of uh, working with uh, private sector and working with the VA and seeing how can it fit the needs because you don't wanna just dump in money because it doesn't work that way. And you, you wanna make sure you have a good outcome. So we, we work with our, our providers to see how would these funds best help our veterans? How can they use it effectively and not make more work for them? Um, because you don't wanna uh, do something that just makes more work for the, the recipient that you're trying to help. Um, so I, I really believe in the value of that, that collaboration, meeting one-on-one -on -one, and um, it, it can be really powerful. Thank you so much. Dr. Elizabeth Cody, um, we still, even with, unfortunately, the huge downturn in employment, have the majority of our country employed through insurer benefits. If you are an employer right now designing benefits, what would be the one or two things you would ask your uh, benefit designer to do to make sure that the benefits are meeting all employees' needs, um, including those most vulnerable? I would love to, I'm loving to answer that question. <laughs> but the first thing, here's where it starts. I'd like to say that my journey has been 40 plus years long but it really didn't start until I gave birth to some mixed race kids and then started to experience the ways that power flows and doesn't flow. And I think a lot of the decision makers feel woke like I did before, like of course everyone should have an equal opportunity to help. And we're in a moment right now where we really need to take advantage of the fact that people are hiring chiefs of diversity, equity and inclusion but hold them accountable. And so what I would ask them to do is say, I'm gonna meet you right where you are on your journey, whoever you are, to be an ally for anybody that doesn't have the same access to health that you would want for yourself and your kids. The first thing I would look at is um, how are benefits used and distributed in your company? In an average company, the lowest income quintile, only a third of employees are offered insurance, health insurance, and only 20% of them accept that because they can't afford the premiums because those premiums are a much larger percentage of their annual income than for the higher income workers or 80% of the workers in the highest quintile are offered and accept those health insurance benefits. So, but the place to start first is just, do you offer health benefits to everybody? Do you offer equal health benefits to everybody? Are they equitable? Now that's tricky. Is it the same income percentage? Are you doing just fixed rate benefit design? Now, are you doing chronic care management that helps people become who have been suffering from cycles of poverty and who aren't advantaged in terms of social determinants of health have the same functionality? as those that have had the privilege of more access over many years to health insurance? Are you using, are you fixing, are you seeding HSA contributions so that lower income folks can appreciate the tax advantage and build wealth like their higher income um, peers can? So within the 60% of people who are provided health insurance by accident by their employers, I think it is a really exciting moment because we can look out there and see what's wrong with the world. And then we can say, well, what kind of world do I wanna create? You know, employers, they just happened to get this weird gatekeeper role of, health, of choosing health insurance. But now they can use it to make the change and be the change they wanna see without waiting for bipartisan or political movement. And we see some people who are very aware. So you start with an audit and that's something that, you know, different folks can help you with. And then you start with a plan just from where you are and what the next step is. Another, I'd say basic step is um, healthcare decision support because 90% of people don't evaluate their health benefits every year. 
They say they would rather scoop dog poop than do that. <laughs> and people are in, in, overinsured, especially lower income people, because they want to avoid unexpected health care costs that they'd have to put on a credit card. In the long term, they're not only paying an absolute total cost for health care that's greater than their than people that are much wealthier than them. Now think of it in terms of a percentage of their salary. That's gross income in equity. And if you, you know, realize the strong correlations between race and gender and ethnicity and disability and income, you can easily surmise and you know how that is just really unjust and addressable without spending any more money by the employer. That leads to a more diverse, I mean, if you have a more equitable healthcare structure, that's a strong signal that you care about diversity and that you want to include people, even if they need a, a lot of health care, you, you want to include people of all voices. So you're helping them have the same opportunity to be healthy and vital and contributing members of your small society that you get to have a disproportionate impact on. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you and including to Dr. Gatson who's, who opened us up today. I'm not gonna turn us over to Dr. Gauga who is, I'm so proud has joined the Preparedness and Treatment Equity Coalition as our Director of Operations. I'm gonna ask her to spend a moment just introducing herself um, as she has a really um, impressive background and then she'll take any questions from the audience or if not pose um, them to yourself. So thank you so much. Hello, so I'm Serena Gulga. As uh, Kirsten said, I joined uh, PTEC actually about well, three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> so I'm the director of operations here at PTEC, so I'm kind of doing a little bit of everything. Um, and in sort of a previous life, and I have to say one thing that is so electrifying about this uh, conversation in previous life, I was a pharmacologist and then I was a social worker. So I'm seeing this. Um, pandemic we're in from many different angles. And I, you know, I, I'm going to pose a question to all of you, I guess. And, you know, thinking about um, how Dr. Gadsden was talking about not just looking at patients as, you know, uh, people with biological issues, but as people who have a sick role that they play in society. So I'm thinking, um, on a larger scale, so in macro social workers, I think in policy and programs. And if you think about how um, socioeconomic disparities and racial disparities sort of fuel this COVID crisis, and we now have a, not only people who have um, COVID and are sick, but we have a sick society really. So uh, my question to you, you know, and in the interest of time, you know, make it brief, but as expansive as you can. How do you think that we can um, use this crisis to inform our next steps on working on um, health inequity and solving this issue that we have? I think this is a really excellent time to sort of cram all of these, you know, um, information and this data that we're getting about the inequities in society, but how do we use that going forward to, you know, address um, other health issues that we will be facing in the coming years? Anyone, if you can start. I'll jump in very quickly uh, because I think you really, you've read it, really said it already. Um, we're in a very unique time um, in our uh, society, in our economy, in our politics, and there's small, there are small windows opening. And you said, cram, we have to push. We have to push. When the door is open, opening, we got to kick it open. This is the time to start thinking about the new initiatives, thinking about the different ways of doing things, because, because people's are, people are listening, leaders are listening, uh, our president is listening, right, and we have these new initiatives um, going forward. The money is there, so push, push, be innovative, push, and try to get those projects um, you know, on the table uh, and in front of people now where last year they may not have, have been even paying attention to these types of issues, right? Similar to what, what uh, Ebony was sharing. Absolutely, Dr. Gatson, it's making this sustainable. Like I said, we're starting off with COVID-19 testing, but when we designed this, we also went straight to our cardio leader and said, part of the issue COVID is, is hitting our, our folks so hard is because we have high blood pressure. And 
you know, that goes to the education. If we start them in kindergarten and we educate them in kindergarten, guess who they go home to? They educate mom, they educate, educate grandma. I can speak from experience as I have a five and a six year old, but we started there. And what we're trying to do is saying, yes, we're committing this hundred million dollars, but what I'm working on every single day is planting the seed of, so what do we do when these dollars run out? Can we earmark this and can we do that? Making this sustainable. This is not gonna be a moment. It's gotta be a movement and we gotta keep going. Mm -hmm. I, I really loved um, and I really loved what Ebony and, and Dr. Gadsden had to say that this is a moment and we have to seize it because these challenges that vulnerable populations have that are exposed by COVID, it's been going on for decades and decades and decades. And each time, you know, when we went through Hurricane Katrina, these same vulnerabilities were exposed when each time we have to finally learn and we have to seize the opportunities. Um, recently, when, during the early stages of the epidemic in the spring, I convened a group of uh, healthcare leaders, frontline leaders, uh, healthcare administrators um, across the United States from the Aspen Institute, from um, the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholarship Program, President's Leadership Scholarship Program, just doctors and healthcare leaders from across the country. And we came up with a set of strategies that are already known and established. This is not new. We don't need to reinvent the wheel about how do you do outreach to these vulnerable populations, even the most basic things like access to broadband or the internet. If, if they don't have that, how can they go and get scheduled for uh, their COVID vaccine, which many health departments are having on websites, these very basic things. Um, so there are a lot of great experts out there who have a lot of great ideas we need to start listening to them and we need to start implementing it. I think also one last thing I wanna say is this is a wonderful um, inoculation against what a lot of people have felt lately as like a hopeless and really dreary time in our lives that we're in a place we thought we'd never experienced. We didn't know how we were gonna get out of it. A lot of people wanna do something about it. And there are so many possible things that are concrete that are not performative, that are actionable and accountable. So the more we can do to connect people with what they actually, the agency they can have, the more results we're gonna have. And as leaders, I think that is our job, is to lift up a lot more people by saying, hey, you have authority, you have agency, and you have an ability to impact this in an accountable, measurable way. And then it's not about you know any one person or any one insight or any one experience but we all have a role to play and it will really feel good. It will help with our own resiliency as a nation. Those are really excellent answers. And I think that, you know, in sort of wrapping up here, um, that Dr. Cody, I think what you've ended with is something that really speaks to me is that we have to start looking at communities. We have to start working with the communities first. You know, a lot of times we do look at leaders for answers, but the people in the communities are the ones who are having the issues, who are dealing with the problems. And they often have the answers to the questions that people higher up are you know, talking about and wondering about. And so if we start there, I think that's a really excellent opportunity to get to the heart of the issues that um, we need to deal with. Um, and I, you know, I have this thing that I've been thinking a lot, a, a lot about, and, I, and that the, the vaccine has been the easy part. You know, as a scientist working in a lab, I know that, yes, it's a lot of labor, but, you know, if you look at the social aspects of distributing this vaccine, that's a much more complex problem than putting together an mRNA vaccine. So uh, I think that we need to sort of keep thinking about that, not only as healthcare leaders, but all the other people who are on this call too. So think about what can we do as members of society to push this forward, not only during the COVID pandemic, but afterward, what can we do to leverage our you know, skills and our experience and frankly, the power that we have, you know, with our fancy titles and everything <laughs> um, to, to really make a change in society. And, you know, build a healthy society. You know, right now we have a sick society and we really, I think everyone will agree that we need a healthy society to move forward and, you know, establishing health equity is a part of that. Um, so I, I'd really like to thank all of our speakers today. You were really fabulous and so many 
excellent answers and I've been scribbling things down as we've been talking. Um, and I, I think that, you know, in closing, um, it's really important for us to remember the power that we have as individuals in um, speaking, not only to people who agree with us, but as another people said, reaching out to people who either may not see the problem or may not understand it or be, you know, as you know, Ms. David gave us the answer to, people who may even be resistant to thinking about these issues. And so um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and I'd like to thank all of our um, guests who have been here. And I'd like to remind you that next week, next month, we'll be having another session uh, scheduled for February 22nd. So keep an eye on our website and our social media for more information about that going forward. Um, thank you everyone for coming and hope to see you next month. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.